Hi, I'm Bob Carr. At the Give Something Back Foundation, we focus on higher education and its transformative effect on young lives, especially for those who have faced adversity. And that's why we're proud to support the important educational programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Valley National Bank, Passaic County Community College, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the Give Something Back Foundation, providing mentors and scholarships to help Pell Grant eligible students go to college and graduate in four years debt free. New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation. ShopRite Supermarkets. And by Choose New Jersey. Our mission is attracting companies to the Garden State. This is One on One. I'm an equal American just like you are. The jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of yesterday. Look at this. You got, you got this? Here it is, man. Look at that. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> when you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? Do you enjoy talking politics? No. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. Our culture, I don't think, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. That's a good question. High five. Steve Adubato, it is uh, my honor, my pleasure to be here at uh, NJIT. Um, it is our, also our honor to introduce uh, Bart Scott, yeah. who is a former NFL player, CBS sports analyst, and also a consultant with uh, Morgan Stanley Global Sports and Entertainment Division that's uh, focused on helping athletes do what? Um, preserve their income, their wealth, grow it. You know, and um, we've been at it for about a year and a half, and it's going well. We have an opportunity to try and change the narrative. Now, you, you played in the NFL for 10 years? 11. 11 made $61 million. Oh, man, we, you did your research. Yeah, it's not, not you listen, Google's, running. Google's a good thing, right? <laughs> but here's the thing. Yep. We had you on not just because you had a great NFL career, and those of us in the New York, New Jersey area know you for the great work you did with the Jets. This is a problem. Describe how serious the problem of the professional athletes, many of whom, and by the way, the study that was done by the folks over at Sports Illustrated, 60% of pro basketball players are broke after five years after they retire, right? Five years after they're broke. Absolutely. How serious is the situation? Well, it's very serious because we're trying to change the narrative, and to do that, we have to educate the athlete so that they can make more informed decisions. If you know better, you do better. And, you know, you know we're on a college campus here, and you go to college so you can get educated, so you can make high-percentage decisions. And, you know, athletes are really challenged with things that, you know, people, other people in society aren't. You know, you can, and it's global sports and entertainment because it's not just athletes, it's anybody that comes into wealth at a young age. It's no, it's no book of how to invest your money, who to trust. Mm -hmm. Everybody's risk is different from, from, my risk may be different from yours, you know. And so we have to really focus on educating and, and getting a playbook. The great thing about athletes, everybody are coachable. All athletes are coachable. They want to be coached. They want to learn this stuff, but they, it's tough because you don't know who to trust. Someone says, all right, we're giving you a million dollars signing bonus. That athlete thinks it's a million dollars. Right, wrong. What is it really? Exactly. It's about probably 60% of that. So you might actually see six million of it, but also you have to pay. 600 grand. Yeah, so yeah, 600 grand. So you have, to, you have to pay people, right? After that, you have to pay your agent. You have to pay your CPA. You got to get a tax plan. You got to learn these type of things. But what happens is a lot of these kids that's coming to a, young, a lot of wealth are coming from areas where their family and their background really don't know what to do with it. And what happens is, you know, we do a segment and we were able to um, really um, sponsor the um, Senior Bowl this year where we had a lot of athletes, a lot of which were going to go. But I think what made well, it... Excuse me, we should make it clear. Sorry for part. The Senior Bowl is a college game where the best of the best... A lot of these it's are different the pros, game. right? Yeah, a lot of them. They're are. signing big deals. Absolutely. Ahead, I'm sorry. But we're able to not only do a program for them, but we're able to do a program for their parents as well. Why? Because their parents are the ones and the family members are the ones that make it a very stressful for the athlete because when you come from an urban area, you have a lot of people that you have to help as well. And one of the hardest things to say you know, I can say no to you easily yeah. because we have no emotional that's attachment. Right. No history. But it's harder to say that to your mom, your dad, or your cousin your that's cousin. homeless. Or, or you, know, you get all these hang-ons, and it's hard, and you have to learn how to say no. And we always inform an athlete that you're, you are the CEO of You, Inc. 
You can grow your company how you choose to. But everything you do, every decision you make should be made to having a strong business that not can only be successful while you're playing, but that can transition. So we talked to him about transitioning out of the NFL. I'm an example of transitioning out, having a plan. The thing that athletes struggle with, they never see the end coming. You heard Alex Rodriguez say the other day, every great athlete always think they have one good season left in them. Mm -hmm. They don't see the end coming, so you don't prepare. Did you? But, well, I, mean, I mean, did you? Because, because, I mean, you're just such a great player. And I'm thinking to myself, as a broadcaster, did you see at a certain point in your 30s, mm -hmm. hey, this is going to come to an end? And did you prepare yourself for the potential for a career in broadcasting and in the other work you're doing? And well, what did you do? I, well, I retired at 32, so I was early into my 30s. But I, I went 10 years without missing a game. So I thought that I couldn't miss a game. I thought I was indestructible, and I tore my toe up. But... Early on in my career, when I played for the Baltimore Ravens for seven years, you know, I took advantage of the continuing education program. I went back and got my degree, and I, I continued to build my brand. And when what I, does that mean, build your brand? Build, build your brand. So at some point as an athlete, my body's going to break down, and I can't sell my body anymore. But what I can sell is my brand. And my brand of being... Your reputation. My reputation, absolutely. And you, you have to ask yourself as an athlete, is anybody going to buy what I'm selling? And you do that by going out into the community, being a quality guy, keeping your nose clean off the field, no, DU, mm -hmm. no DUIs, you know, no... No, no uh, party in no a way party, that gets no you in trouble. Is exactly. No Johnny Manziel. No disrespect to Johnny no, exactly. Manziel. Johnny Manziel. Just, no, he's, I, listen, he's, I don't want to point him out, but no, let me no, ask you this. Damaged goods. His brand. Damaged goods. How, he can't even sell his body, let alone his brand. You know, so... So say he says to himself, you know, Bart, you can't tell me anything. I'm a superstar. Everybody loved me in college. I signed a big bonus. I signed with the Browns. Don't tell me anything. Proof's in the pudding. For every person I can show you, I can show you a dear friend of mine, Ray Rice, who damaged his brand. Now he can't sell it. He can't get a job. He's a good young it, man at Rutgers. Right, and he's seen as toxic, right? You can't sell it. And what happens is perception is reality in this game. So you can work hard to change to be a better person. A really which, bad decision. Right, which Ray Rice did. Uh, impulsive decision can change the course because there's always another athlete behind you. Right? NFL, not for long. And it's not just the NFL, it's the NBA, it's any sport. You know, what happens as an athlete, you have to understand that you can be replaced. Mm. You know, you can be replaced in an instant. So you have to prepare for that. You have to prepare for the transition because no matter what, whether you play four years, whether you play seven years or 10 years or 20 years like Tom Brady, at some point you're going to have to transition. You're going to have to do something else with your life. And if you have a good brand, you have options. And that's what you want to buy. Because, you know, I heard Joe Torre, not Joe Torre, um, Girardi. The, the, Joe Girardi. Joe Girardi, right? He talked about an athlete dies two deaths, right? Because it's painful, you know, because you've done this so your whole life. A-Rod's going through it right now as exactly. we speak, but go ahead. You, you've invested so much. That's why Michael Jordan came back. Not because he needed the money, because he missed the cheers. It's nothing that you can do or that, that, can, that can duplicate going out, in front of 70,000 people, busting your butt, preparing for battle, and going out and being able to have a physical consequence. You know, nothing can replace that. It's the ultimate drug. But, That's why guys can't walk away. But the consequence of it, the consequence of not preparing for your future after your body breaks down. Right. Serious. We've seen athletes. Yeah. Hang on too long. But they have not only no money, not only do they go broke, but they have serious financial problems and then all of a sudden, they're into all kinds of things to try to make gotta take a risk. bad things happen. You have to take a risk. We talk about it, you know, day one in our financial literacy program. We talk about that earning curve. You know, most people coming out of college, that earning curve, they go immediately into debt. An athlete, it spikes up. How do you keep, make that curve extend and, and, and have longevity? How do you stretch that curve and make it longer and make it stay at this level before you dip down and go underneath? Well, you make great decisions. You have a financial playbook and you stick to the plan. You stick to the plan. You have to learn how to say no. Because at the end of the day, you're going to have to be the one that explain to your kids why they have to move out the house. And that's a tough conversation to have. You bring it largely to inner city kids? No, it's not just inner city kids. Not just. It's, it's anybody, right? Because we all, want, we all want wealth. We all want sustainable health. We all want to have a sustainable lifestyle, right? Why, why, why should I have a great lifestyle, you know, 15, you know, only during the time that I play and have to scale back? What happens is you, you get this elaborate, luxurious lifestyle, and it's not sustainable. 
it's not sustainable because you didn't you didn't make it sustainable. Everybody has that retirement number, right? Yeah. You know, so that you can have that number that you can <clears throat> have the same quality of life. But you ha you're going to have to work. Let, let me ask you this though. Mm -hmm. You also talk about giving back. Oh, absolutely. Why? Because it, someone it, says, Wait, "Hold on, you tell me about I got a, a, a mass and attain and save, and now you tell me I got to give back." I tell you what, what better way to build your brand, right? When you go, not only the the great thing about charity is. It's beneficial in two ways. You have the charity part of charity, and then you have then you have the networking and the business branding part of charity, right? So you know when you're in there, you 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 are able to be in a room with people that are have the ability to give, right? And you meet people, and that's, that's where right. that's where building and networking. We say it all the time. It's not about your net worth. It's about your network because people won't give you money, but they'll give you information. And when you're trying to transition and go to a different field, information is vital. I'm curious as to how you got so smart at this stuff, but I got to ask you this one. Uh, as a student of leadership, you've had to lead on the field. You lead off the field. The number one lesson, I remember, hold on, you remember you were a linebacker. Mm -hmm. And you had to call all kinds of plays. You had to keep people in line or all around you, personalities. Number one lesson you learned about leadership in life and football is? Well, you have to be able to be a great listener, right? And you have to also, be, to be a great leader, you have to be a great follower. And you understand that, you know, sometimes you may have to follow, sometimes you have to lead, but you have to be bold, you have to dare to be great, right? So you have to step out and you can't do what's popular, right? You have to do what's right. Mm -hmm. it's, it's easy to do what's easy and follow the masses, but a leader stands up for what's right and what he believes in. You have to say, what do I stand for? Mm. And you don't compromise that for anybody. That's what leaders do. Bart Scott, you can check him out. CBS, yeah, man, uh, sports analyst. Check him out on the weekends. He's great. Good stuff. Uh, former NFL player. He gave us a lot to cheer for with the Jets here. And uh, Morgan Stanley, Global Sports Entertainment Division uh, consultant there. I want to thank you, Bart. Appreciate it. Pleasure's all mine. All good. Stay right here. We'll be right back right after this from the New Jersey Institute of Technology. Thank you. My pleasure. To watch more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. Steve Adubato, more importantly, we are at the 2016 PGA Championship at beautiful Baltus Straw Golf Club in Springfield, New Jersey. It is my honor to introduce uh, one of the hottest pros on the PGA Tour. You like that? I like that. It's true. He's uh, Morgan Hoffman, PGA um, Tour Pro and the Health Ambassador for Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield New Jersey and RWJ Barnabas Health. Jersey guy, right? Correct. Yep. Wyckoff, New Jersey. When did you get into golf? Pretty young. In diapers, I uh, started off with a little, I guess, Fisher Price set. And um, I started the first tournament was when I was eight years old. So. This term, ambassador, you're ambassador to, uh, um, to RWJ Barnabas Health and um, Horizon, we're actually in a very crowded uh, air condition, I'll say that here in uh, um, getting into August, uh, late July in, uh, in New Jersey, it is hot, but we're in the uh, Horizon and RWJ Barnabas booth here, if you will. Your connection to these organizations and in a program called Healthy Steps New Jersey. Yeah, Healthy Steps New Jersey is really cool. I've been doing it for, I guess, two and a half years now. We uh, started at the Barclays a couple of years ago with a little pedometer. And uh, we raised some money, and uh, every step I took throughout the week, and uh, through that, uh, we kind of built a relationship and uh, a, a nice partnership with uh, Barnabas and Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield. And it's really special to be a part of it because I'm so into health and, and fitness. Uh, my regimen with working out and eating is is uh, pretty strict, and they are very strict with their. Uh, rules and, and regulations for t teaching young kids how to become healthy. Talk about the connection, Morgan, between golf and mental and physical health because it, it is very clear. It is, yeah. I mean, it's a long day out there. We play uh, on average is like five hour rounds on the PGA Tour and uh, now, especially in the summer, it's hot. Um, but, you know, there's more guys now that are younger. Every young guy is an athlete. Uh, it's not just golfers out there that are walking around or in golf carts. And, um, you know, look at Rory McIlroy, his transformation from when he was younger, a little overweight, and now he's working out and hitting it further. And uh, I think it's a good uh, person to look after and, and learn from. Well, let's talk about this, though. I was just telling you about our sons who are 12 and 13 as we do this program. Is it tough to get kids into golf? And if 
you do want to get them into golf because of the benefits. What are the best ways to do it? Because 18 holes can be tough. What are some of the best ways to get them into golf? I think the best way is to treat them like a kid. You know, any anything that is fun for a kid that will attract them. So keep it short and simple. If they love the game, then let them do it. If they don't, let them you know go play baseball or or do whatever they they like. You know, I, I think. Um, a lot of parents pressure their kids into doing things and um, take them to the range. And I think Top Golf is an amazing new thing for the game of golf because it's it's something that's fun and gets them not on the golf course for 18 holes and five hours. And uh, but for kids, I think just keeping it simple, have them have a chipping contest with buddies and friends or your parents, and um, just have fun. Keep a smile on their face. You don't have to do all 18. Exactly. Talk a little bit more about your Jersey roots, right? Born and raised in what town? Wyckoff, New Jersey, yeah. The connection between golf, New Jersey, and the importance of the PGA Championship being right here at this gorgeous golf club uh, at Baltusrol. Yeah, it's really cool. I did a, uh, an outing at Cy Wanoi, uh Golf Club, which is the first PGA Championship in uh, New York up by Westchester uh, the other day. And it's really cool to be here, part of Baltusrol, and. Uh, having any golf tournament in New Jersey, especially the Barclays, for the most part every year. Uh, this year I think it's at Beth Page, and um, it's really cool. I think New Jersey is, and the New York City tri-state area is really cool, and they're big supportive of, big supporters of golf, and especially when big tournaments like this come into town, it's it's it's, it's amazing that the turnout the, today. Looking out, what does it do for a, a what does it do for a state from a media perspective, from an economic perspective? What does it do? It does a lot. I mean, it does a lot for the the course, the area around. And uh, I was just talking to one of my friends who is, owns a restaurant in New York City, and it's it blows up this week. I mean, any week where a PGA Championship or PGA Tour event is that week, it, it blows up around the area, and it's great for the economy. And and uh, I think the fans come out and have a good time. Let me ask you this: Put you on the spot. Um, there's a there are rankings in the PGA, um, and they change all the time, right? There are a lot of folks watching you right now who are Googling you and want to see where you rank, but more importantly, you're a pretty young guy and you have a bright future. Talk about what you'd like to accomplish on this tour. Uh, I mean, I've had dreams as winning majors as a kid, you know, like having putting contests with my dad and five footers saying, all right, I want this to win the Masters. And uh, I got lucky enough to play the Masters last year and it was a first taste and it was amazing. It was the greatest experience of my life. and. Uh, I can't wait. At Augusta. At Augusta, yeah. I can't wait to get back, and that uh, it course suits me well. And um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to win a major one day. And my dream's always been to be number one in the world, so I'm working towards that. Real quick, uh, you played Augusta. Shake hands with Jack Nicklaus. Yeah, he's uh, a friend of mine. Actually, I can say that now. He's I'm a member at the Bears Club in Jupiter, which is his course. So I he's the Golden Bear. That's correct. You got to talk real quick. You got to tell us what's he really like. He's awesome. Really, really nice. So before I played in the Masters. Uh, he was, we were in the gym together actually, which is... <laughs> you were in the gym together with Jack Nicklaus? Yeah, he's up there a bunch. He's getting work done from a PT and uh, he comes out and spends time with all the guys and on the range. And uh, I think there's 25 PGA Tour pros at that course now in Jupiter. And uh, he's great. He gave me advice, you know, on certain greens at Augusta and taking advice from Jack Nicklaus about anything is pretty cool. Speaking about advice, I, I got to do the last question for Morgan. Um, well, finally, I have a leadership question for him, but I want to get this out of the way. Barry Ostrowski is here from RWJ Barnabas Health, the CEO, and Bob Marino, uh, the leader over at Horizon. Both of them play golf. They're not going to get on the PGA Tour anytime soon. I saw you talking to both of them. The Golden Bear, if you will, um, Jack Nicklaus gave you some advice. Did you give those guys any advice? I saw you talking to them. Uh, they weren't really asking about their golf games. They were kind of bragging on how not great they are. <laughs> they are being honest. Yeah, they were being honest. They were giving each other kind of a hard time and about their games, but it was pretty funny. They, they looked like they had uh, a good little game every weekend that they play against each other. So, uh, But yeah, my advice to any amateurs is just work on your short game and putting I think is really important. That's what we should do. Me, Marino, Ostrowski, and all these guys who play on the weekends, the advice for everyone watching right now is not See how far you can drive that ball, but what, Morgan? Yeah, work, work on your short game. Don't try and swing hard. Just keep it simple and smooth. This is coming from uh, Morgan Hoffman, PGA 
Tour Pro and Health Ambassador uh, for Horizon Blue Cross and Blue Shield of New Jersey and RWJ Barnabas Health. All right, last one, you ready? I ask all the great leaders this question. I'm fascinated by leadership. The number one leadership lesson you've learned in your few years on this earth, but in some very tough challenges, the number one leadership challenge, excuse me, the number one leadership lesson you learned so far on the tour is? You know, lessons I can't really put a pinpoint on it. I, I've learned so many things from great guys. Phil Mickelson, I play most of my practice rounds with uh, Charles Howell, and uh, he's big on just treating everybody like you want to be treated, you know, the, the golden rule per se. And um, honesty is key, I think, especially in business. Um, you know, just being upfront and not hiding anything and just tell them how it, how it is. And I think that's really important with uh, talking to yourself and with uh, your employees. For someone who didn't have any leadership lessons, you just gave a few out. Thanks so much, Morgan. Appreciate it. Yeah, anytime. Thank All you. the best on it. Thank you. To see more one on one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We're here with uh, Dr. A.M. Barrett, who is Director of Stroke Rehabilitation Research at Kessler Foundation. We're here at a terrific conference uh, in West Orange, New Jersey, Life After Stroke Innovations and Research, Reclaiming Life and Regaining Independence. Doctor, we've talked many times in the studio, uh, but the question is, this particular issue, this conference, why significant? We're going to talk today about how problems, not only the problems you can see, but the problems you can't see affect people after stroke, how it can limit their lives and how we can make them better. Such as? After stroke, the GPS in our brains that tells us where things are can be broken. It can give us the wrong information. But almost never do we find out that we have this problem after stroke, and almost never do we get the treatment. So we're trying to address that in the Kessler Foundation. Yeah, you may see around the doctor's neck, and she brought this in the studio. Um, we were taping a program, and, and she brought these goggles in the studio, and they are called? Prism adaptation goggles. Say it again? Optical prism goggles. Okay, and they are particularly, for a particular kind of ailment that people, uh, deal with after stroke, which is called? Spatial neglect. Talk about spatial neglect and then talk about the goggles. Mm -hmm. Well, when people have had a stroke that affects the right brain, we all know that the right brain is supposed to be kind of creative and innovative. Well, this right brain tells us where our bodies are at all times, right? So you've seen me do this demonstration before. When I put on my glasses with my eyes closed, I can do it because my right brain knows all the coordinates and knows how to make the movement. But what can happen when somebody has spatial neglect is they lose that ability. And what's interesting is when you make these kind of mistakes, people don't say, oh, the person has had a stroke. There's a problem going on in her brain. Instead, they think, oh, you know, she's not trying. She's got some kind of issue. What does that person see? That person is seeing the world in a different way than you and I are. And when they wear these goggles that change what they see, you know, you can see that the goggles have a, 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 a curve on them, a surface curve, and they change where you see things so that the distortion in the world is corrected. It corrects the distortion? Yes, so if you make movements while you're wearing these goggles, you can actually reprogram the way that your vision and your movement systems work together. Talk about the economics of this. How much, no, how much they cost? Sure, oh, absolutely. Well, I mean, you can see that they're really, really expensive, right? <laughs> not. They are... Um, they're not. Right, exactly. These, these are cheaper than an exercise bicycle. They're cheaper than a whirlpool, you know, for people to sit in to relax their muscles. Um, and it takes about a day to train somebody to use them, a therapist to use them. So it's not something that's extremely labor-intensive either. They fit into the therapy schedule, especially in the inpatient hospital setting. But most people just aren't comfortable with them. Medicine as a field and rehabilitation as a field moves kind of slowly on the speed of trust. And so we have to help people to trust these goggles that have been scientifically supported. So that's really the whole idea. As I said, I'm pointing to the sign over here if you're wondering what I'm pointing at. That's the research. Innovation, right? Exactly. That's exactly right. We're trying to show with research from the laboratory, but also research from people's real lives, you know, how can we get these goggles into people's hands, as you say? How can we get something that's inexpensive, and even it saves money for the system, for the how? hospital? It can cut the amount of time, we think, in our kind of initial uh, activities, the amount of time that people actually have to spend in the hospital. And that's because, let's say that your movement system were distorted, you might fall. Then you're in the hospital for an extra 
after three, four days, you might have trouble getting up and using your walker. Well, if you can learn that a day sooner, you can get home a day sooner. So, in many ways, this conference tonight, uh, we're at Kessler Foundation's conference, Life After Stroke. Uh, Dr. Barrett's been with us before, but we're really moving forward in this uh, process of trying to understand life after stroke. You're saying if more people had access to these goggles, there's the potential to not only make people better, improve the quality of life, but reduce healthcare costs. That's what we hope, and that's what we're about to try to do with a group of hospitals across the country. Real quick question before I let you out of here. Um, you're so fascinated by life after stroke because? Well, I think that I was always interested in how the brain changes, but people stay the same. And so people can have what do you mean by that? problems. Well, so this is a, it's a really philosophical question you've asked me. And I think that what really inspires me is you see people whose brains are really different and who do things so differently, right? But these people, in a very essential way, are exactly the same as the rest of us. They're exactly the same. And so when, I'm, when I met and was able to, we, tonight we have a lot of people who are, have these kind of hidden disabilities with us tonight. And we see really not just that they're courageous and they have spirit, but they, they really are are us. And when something is us, we have to do something about it. And we have to hear them, listen to them, under, try to understand them. Yes, exactly. And we have to be part of that, what they're doing. Thank you, Dr. Barrett. Thank you, sir. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Valley National Bank. Passaic County Community College, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the Give Something Back Foundation, New Jersey Sharing Network, ShopRite Supermarkets, and by Choose New Jersey. Promotional support provided by Commerce Magazine and by HipNewJersey.com. Live hard, work hard, play hard. You're from New Jersey and so are we. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Hi, I'm Peter Rooney. In 2006, I lost my father to renal disease. He was on the waiting list for a new kidney, but did not receive one in time. Unfortunately, so many like my father have lost their lives while waiting for a life-saving organ. At New Jersey Sharing Network, we're committed to saving and enhancing people's lives through organ and tissue donation and by informing people about this important decision. Because you can make a difference and save a life.